Uh, all right, so uh, if I may, good evening, everyone. Uh, whether it's evening or not, it doesn't matter. It seems to, to be like, at least in, in, this, in this room. Uh, welcome, uh, everyone, to 2010 uh, Massey Lecture in Mathematical Sciences. My name is Marek Elżanowski, and I am acting as chair of uh, Faribur's Massey Department of Mathematics and Statistics. And before I introduce today's speakers, I just wanted to uh, say a word or two about the series itself. We started that in 2006, uh, thanks to a generous gift from uh, the Masaya Foundation and, and Dr. Faribur's Masi. Uh, so today's uh, lecture is a third of a series. We have it every other year. We invite prominent mathematicians to be in residence uh, at Portland State and to give a public lecture like the one today and a, and, a, and a research talk that happened yesterday and interact with faculty and students. Uh, and we hope that it will continue uh, in years uh, to come. Uh, now, it gives me particular pleasure to introduce uh, today's speakers. That's uh, Dr. Doug Arnold, who is uh, McKnight Presidential Professor of Mathematics at Minnesota. And uh, he is also currently president of SIAM, which is the Society for Industrial and Applied Mathematics, which is a, a, a leading professional organization for applied mathematicians and computer scientists. And I, as I understand, it has about 13,000 uh, members already and is growing uh, and expanding uh, quite a bit uh, eastwards, in particular, as I, as I understand. So, Dr. Arnold uh, received his PhD from the University of Chicago in uh, seven, uh, <laughs> not 1797. <laughs> 1979, his first job was at the University of Maryland, then he moved to Penn State, and finally in 2001 uh, to University of Minnesota, where he uh, assumed the position of uh, director of IMA, which is an uh, institute for mathematics and its applications, which is a, a sort of a joint venture between University of Minnesota and NSF. And uh, he remained at the director of that institute uh, till 2008, and it grew under his leadership to be the largest of institute of, 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 its, of its kind. Uh, his area of uh, research is in numerical analysis and partial differential equations, also mechanics, and in particular, the interplay between these fields. He has written about 80 papers, serves on a number of editorial boards of scientific uh, journals, and uh, number of advisory and scientific boards. He gave a plenary lecture at the International Congress of Mathematicians in Beijing in 2002, and also at a joint mat uh, mathematics meeting in Washington, and that was, I believe, in 2009. So, at 2008, he was awarded Guggenheim Fellowship and became a foreign member of the Norwegian Academy of Sciences and Letters in 2009. So he, and he writes about himself, and that's that you probably enjoy in particular, that his priorities are efforts to increase public understanding of mathematics and its role in the society. And today, he's going to speak about the mathematics of uh, golf or something like that. We, we, wondered, we wonder where we should, uh, I'm sure there are some golfers, and so, and I hope after that lecture you will be able, able to improve your uh, sort of a golfing skills, and we thought about possibly charging you a fee for that. <laughs> but then, well, we decided we won't do that, but please do remember, if indeed uh, you will, and I'm sure you will improve your skills, and that will result in building your self-esteem or financial gains. Do not forget where you learned about this. <laughs> <laughs> so, without well, any, any delay, uh, let me introduce Doug Arnold. Thank you very much. I uh, understand uh, Marek's talent as a uh, building the support for the Farabouz Massey Department of Mathematical Sciences. <laughs> It's really a pleasure uh, for me to be here. He neglected to mention one of the lectures I'll give is the Farah Borsmasi Lecture in Mathematical Sciences. Um, concerning whether it will improve your golf game or whether you should have taken this hour and been out on the links, I have to start with a confession. 
So I am not a golfer, so this may surprise you. Uh, I'm taking the intellectual view of this subject, and I think that you deserve an explanation why I did, and I'll give you that. But first of all, in my defense, I'll, I'll quote from one of the great sports philosophers of our time, baseball player and coach Yogi Berra, who said, 90% of this game is half mental. <laughs> and so that's the 90%, or maybe it's the half, I'm not sure, that I'm going to be focusing on. One reason I'm talking about uh, math and golf at this time is that this great invitation came to me very close to Math Awareness Month. Actually, April is Math Awareness Month, but we're just past April. And this year, it so happens that the theme of Mathematics Awareness Month, which, by the way, has been ratified by the Congress of the United States, is uh, Mathematics and Sports. And they produced, among other things, a number of posters for this. And there's this one. And this is most definitely not me. However, the equations are, are mine. I furnished those equations, and you can barely see them, but we'll get back to both of these equations. They'll show up in the lecture. When did I get started thinking about math and golf, and why golf? Well, I got a very interesting phone call from a PR firm that was producing a public relations spot that played during the uh, Masters tournament a couple of years ago. It was being paid for by um, Exxon Mobil, and its theme was my favorite theme, uh, that math and science are everywhere, and this was giving the example of golf. So let me start by showing you that. Uh, let's see. I have to get it here, though. Sorry, I'll start it over again when I figure Math out how and science are everywhere. Uh, here it is. That's so, why, along with Exxon Mobil, let's start my that wife again. Amy. Math and science are everywhere. Notice the equations there again. That's why, along that's with Exxon Mobile, my wife Amy and I created the Math and Science Teachers the Academy, Drag where elementary school there. teachers can learn new ways to inspire their students. Because if kids learn math and science, they can achieve almost anything. I'm Phil Mickelson, and I'm proud to work with Exxon Mobil. So it's a great deal of fun producing that. Um, this was a really professional organization, as you can imagine. And uh, one thing they were very concerned in, and uh, which made it fun for me, is all the equations that flew by like that are perfectly correct and perfectly suited to the situation. So how, does, how do these equations, and how does math get into golf? Well, actually, it would be possible to teach a course on math and golf and go on for 40 hours. But so I'm just going to give you some highlights, and I'm going to pick up three parts. First of all, the swing, where you take a golf club and you accelerate it till it hits the ball, then that impact of, of club and ball, and finally the flight of the ball, which are three aspects of golf. I'll, I'll skip all sorts of them, like, for example, the movement of the ball on the uh, turf. <clears throat> so here's a, a still from, uh, that's Phil Mickelson in this uh, public service ad, and there are those equations again. And so here I'm going to look at the swing, oops, the swing, which is uh, when this golf uh, club is accelerated down to the point where it hits this ball. And a good golf club uh, swing like Mickelson's can move this nearly half pound uh, club head from zero to 120 miles an hour in a quarter of a second. So a huge acceleration, far more than any Ferrari could hope to achieve. Uh, and here's a, sl uh, a slow motion and I'll try to get it up here, of uh, Phil doing this. So let me stop it there. Uh, well, let's let it go, and I'll do it again. That's a very precise uh, motion. Um, let's look at it a little bit. Well, one thing you notice here is that his arms are quite straight, and of course the club shaft is quite straight, and his arms are changing angles, and the club shaft is changing angles with the arm, right? So for example, right now, there is quite a acute angle, small angle, between his arms and the shaft, and then in that movement down, which starts now, he comes around to the point where there's a 180 degree angle. So that is often um, modeled uh, but in this way. So here you see sort of a picture of several steps along the way. And you can model this 
the two arms form a triangle and this bisector of it is a straight line which you can think of as a pendulum that's swinging around a fulcrum that's happening between the shoulders and then there's another pendulum here. So these are actually coupled pendulum equations, double pendulum equations where theta and phi are the two angles, the angle between the vertical and the arms and the angle between the shaft and uh, the arms. And uh, these tau zero and tau h are the torques that you put on at these points, the forces that he imparts to it. So here's a double pendulum. Got a pendulum here and a pendulum here. Could you, uh, I think the last one of the programs works, the very bottom, yeah. That'll bring it up, right? Can everybody see that? Um, and so <coughs> I'll, I'll take it to a fairly similar position. Say he's, here's his back swing, and I'll give it a slight push. And watch the pink. Now I'm not giving it any further forces. But you notice it's swinging rather fast, also rather unpredictably at this point. But look at the speeds that the, the end of the pink one gets at certain moments when things go um, line up just right. So you have to be careful, this thing is dangerous. Let me give you that one more time. You get these very fast motions. So actually the usual purpose for a double pendulum like this is to explain sensitive dependence on initial conditions and chaotic dynamical systems, but that's not what we have here because we're only interested in the initial forced swing. What we're interested in, the fact is that this thing is whipping around from almost zero degrees to 180 degrees in a short time is what's giving that tremendous speed. Uh, that can be simulated by solving the pendulum and differential equations. And it's useful for all sorts of purposes. For example, this is called a trebuchet, a type of medieval catapult. This was the earliest form of biological warfare. They would put diseased corpses in here, and with this double pendulum motion, they could fling them high over the walls and into the city that they were trying to destroy. <clears throat> Another example of the pendulum motion and the big speeds it can allow you to get would be a whip. A whip can be well modeled mathematically, not as a double pendulum, but as a multiple pendulum with a lot of different things. And if you give the motions right, apply torques here just right, you can get it so all these sort of angles line up, and therefore this one is swinging out very, very quickly, and that's why a whip cracks, because you actually reach faster than the speed of sound at the point, and you get a sonic boom. Okay, <clears throat> well, so what I'm saying here is that this double pendulum is a mathematical model of the golf swing. Is it a good mathematical model? Well, that depends what you want from your mathematical model. It gives us a lot of insight as how you get those high speeds um, from, from the golf swing, because as you can see, that's captured in this simple model. It's accurate enough for many purposes, for other purposes, maybe not, so it's often been improved. So one is, if you look carefully at that slow motion I had, you'll see that Mickelson's fulcrum doesn't stay fixed. He pushes it in the direction of the ball. The motion of the fulcrum is very important. Uh, and actually, with that one change, you can get a very good um, accuracy, high fidelity reproduction of the true golf swing. But people have improved this for various purposes. A swing is not really in a plane, so they go to three-dimensional motion, and a two-plane is often used. The golf, um, the shaft is not absolutely rigid, it's a springy piece of metal, and that slight bending is quite important, and that's been modeled. You can model the whole body and so forth. So here's one of the messages I want to give in this talk. You use mathematical modeling to model some phenomenon. Well, all models are wrong. They all have errors in them. You leave out pieces, and that's as it should be. Because if you, if you put in every possible thing to model it uh, completely, it's so complicated you can't work with it. What you want is a model that gives you some insight into the situation, allows you to compute the quantities that are of interest to you without undue complications. Um, for example, nobody would use the theory of relativity to uh, help model a golf swing because although it is correct, the small corrections it would make are just... Uh, are, are irrelevant, redundant, distracting from the main point. So I like this quote of George Box, a statistician, all models are wrong, but some are useful. <laughs> so what useful for what in the case of golf? Well, you, I already showed you a swing simulation, or I, I guess I didn't show you a swing simulation, so I should. Um, 
Here's a swing simulation using the pendulum equations. So just solving those ODEs, you can uh, simulate the motion of the thing. And you can see here this very fast swing that you get at the end. Um, you can simulate them not only numerically, but you could also simulate them uh, through a mechanical model, a robot. And this is a robot at the uh, US Golf Association that was used for testing balls and clubs. You can see it's a double pendulum with a fulcrum right here, and then the second fulcrum right here. And so you use a model like this for things like identifying what's important for how fast you can get the uh, uh, club to swing, the length of the shaft, the weights, the wrist angle, and so forth. So one of the things that they've discovered by studying this model is the torque you put with your, uh, at, the, at your shoulders is very important. The torque you put on your wrist is almost of no importance at all, and really your wrists should be limp, except for the purpose of making sure that the the strike is at the right point, but the forces you impart with your wrist don't help. That can be studied quite accurately with this model. Uh, and so forth, uh, uh, to analyze the equipment, to analyze the golfer itself, and basically to get insight and understanding of how the golf swing works. Okay, so that's a quick little start. Let's move from the swing onto the impact. So the moment that the uh, club uh, hits the ball. So this is again a still from that public service ad with uh, my favorite equation here. Uh, and this is, we also made a website that went along with the uh, public service ad and this is a frame uh, capture from that website and it shows a golf club hitting a golf ball and you can see the golf ball has deformed under the force of the club. And uh, so the, the, this period of impact that's captured in this uh, photo is about a two thousandth of a second and in that time, the momentum and energy of the club head is transferred to the ball. And the idea is to get the ball going as fast as possible, so it'll go as far as possible. <clears throat> Here's a picture from a laboratory. It's a slightly different thing. This uses a theory, a, uh, theory of relativity, namely, if the club head is heavy enough that the ball was, doesn't affect it, which is not quite true, then you get the exact same result by having the club hit the ball or having the ball hit the club. Change, just changing your coordinate system. So here they shot a golf ball at a solid wall. It's like a very heavy club. And this is this two thousandth of a second of contact starting right around here and ending right around here. And you can see the ball deforms tremendously. So it becomes a sort of spring with a very large spring constant where energy is stored in there. And then it springs out. And in fact, it even springs out. If you'll notice, this is even elongated a little more than, uh, than a sphere. And that's the moment of transfer. And let's see what happens in that moment. Well, this is best measured by looking at two quantities, energy and momentum. So remember, a momentum is the mass of an object times its velocity, mv. And the kinetic energy is 1 half mv squared. Uh, and momentum is conserved. So what's the momentum of the club and ball system before they hit? Well, the ball is sitting still, not contributing any momentum. But the club is moving at a speed that we saw um, gets up to 120 miles an hour. It weighs about a quarter, uh, about 0.4 pounds. So you take that mass times the velocity, and this would give you the momentum before collision. After collision, that momentum has gone somewhere else. Well, part of it's in the fact that the club continues to move, but slower. And so we have a new speed, capital V is the club after collision times the mass. And then we have uh, the ball has a much smaller mass, and it picks up a certain speed, V ball. And so we have that equation. Now we have something very similar if kinetic energy is conserved. So here I have 1 half mv squared for the club before equals 1 half mv squared for the club after plus 1 half m ball squared, mv squared for the ball. And now we can do algebra. We have two equations. We can solve for any two unknowns. And the two that we solve for is the speed of the ball and the club after. And I just wrote down one of the answers, the speed of the ball after. So here's an example. You take a mathematical model. And to analyze this one, all you need is high school algebra. Sometimes you need to invent a whole new field of mathematics. But sometimes high school algebra is plenty. And this is what you get if you solve these two equations. Uh, the speed, and you can learn a lot by looking at this equation. So the ball afterwards is going the same speed as the club before times this factor, this fraction. 
And what is that factor? Well, it's 2 divided by 1 plus something, so it's less than 2. Uh, and this 1 plus something, well, if the club is very, very heavy, this 1 plus something is just about 1. Then this fraction m ball over m club is close to 0. And the, the mass ratio of ball and club is what matters here. So this is saying that if your club is very, very heavy, then your ball speed will be a little bit less than double your club speed. So there's the formula again. So the ball leaves the tee at a little less than double the club speed. And um, as the, the heavier the club is, the closer you get to double. OK, now let's put in a real ball's uh, weight and club weight and uh, use this formula. And you find that if the club uh, was accelerated to 120 miles an hour, which is a good figure for a pro golfer, then you'll get a ball speed of about 195 miles an hour. Well, that's not quite right. Uh, all mathematical models are, are wrong, and there is some error in this. And what's the error? Well, the error is that the kinetic energy is not really conserved. If you think, when you took physics, they told you energy was conserved. They didn't tell you kinetic energy was conserved. There's different kinds of energy, and some of the energy goes to other things. For example, if you take a hammer and start hammering in a nail, the energy your hammer mostly pushes that nail in, but some of it just gets the nail hot. Same thing is true with a ball. Some uh, energy is lost to heat and damage the ball and so forth. And here you see sort of the same example in this time exposure. You drop a basketball, and from its height it bounces. If no energy was lost, it would bounce up to the same height. But in fact, it only bounces up a fraction of that. And that fraction is called the coefficient of restitution, CR. It's a number between 0 and 1. If I used a super ball, it would be close to 1. Basketball is more like 0.75. A golf ball is about 0.78 or so. Um, <clears throat> so this is the corrected formula, a better mathematical model, where now instead of 2 on the top, we have 1 plus this CR. And if you put in 0.78, then you find out that the, uh, if you hit the ball at 120 miles an hour, it will go off at about 175 miles an hour. And that's about right. OK, that's the impact. And now I want to move to the last part, which will also be the, the longest and most complicated part, where a lot of interesting mathematics had to be developed, mathematics and physics. So the flight of the golf ball. OK, so what is the story now is we have this golf ball, and it goes off. We know the speed, say, 175 miles an hour. And we know the angle. Well, I didn't talk about that, but uh, golf clubs are designed at an angle, and golfers know how to hit it, so you've got a certain launch angle. And so all of you who have taken calculus have probably solved many problems, far more than you enjoyed, where you were given a, an initial speed and launch angle, and you figure out where the ball goes. And of course, you get f beautiful parabola pictures like this, right? You take the initial velocity vector and use vector addition to break it up into a horizontal component, v0 cos theta, and a vertical component, v0 sine theta. And then you say, well, there are no forces acting on the ball in the horizontal direction, so it just travels with speed v0 cos theta, according to Newton's first law. And so its position at any time t is v0 cos theta t. And in the y direction, there's that term, but there is a force, gravity, minus 1 half gt squared. And so that leads you, this is quadratic, this is linear, and so the whole thing's a downward pointing parabola. OK, and they, oh, then the teacher asks questions like, how high does it reach, or where does it hit the ground, blah, blah, blah. OK, well, let's take a look at a real golf ball in flight. Take a look at our new technology here this week, the Pro Tray. OK, let's see. Before I do that, let me show you something. Uh, you see this little? Let's take a look at our new technology here this week. Wait, wait, wait. I don't want to do that here. Let's take a look at. Thank you. Stop. Ah, I'm having a hard time controlling my video. Let's take a look at it. OK. I wanted to point out this little white spot here, which you probably can barely see. That's the flag. That's where the golf ball is supposed to end up. This is Phil Mickelson. He's pretty good. This is the Buick Invitational. Now we can watch. A new technology here this week, the Pro Tracer. And that's exactly what Peter Costas was talking about, cutting it back into the breeze for Phil. Perfect. Amazing. There's the the flag right here. OK, but let's look at this. Does this look like a downward curving parabola to you? No. I mean, it's not even close. So some mathematical models are not useful. And the parabola you studied so much in calculus is not useful for the flight of the golf ball. 
Okay, what went wrong? What did we neglect that we should have gotten? Well, they always say, neglecting air resistance. <laughs> well, you can neglect air resistance, but the golf ball does not neglect air resistance. And so we need to count for the um, effect of air resistance on the flight of the golf ball. Okay, so let's see what's involved in that. Well, in this picture, what I've done is I've drawn a golf ball. Golf ball, by the way, spins rapidly. Um, and I've put an arrow indicating that gravity acts on it. And I've put this other arrow, which is the way air resistance acts on it. I don't know exactly where that is. But now I'm going to again use vector addition to break that up into two pieces. One, I'm going to choose not horizontal and vertical, but rather one is in the direction of the flight of the ball, or rather in the reverse direction of the flight of the ball, and that's called drag. So the definition of drag is air resistance uh, pushing against the, directly against the flight of the ball. And then there's the other component, because this vector breaks up into two pieces. The other component, which goes roughly upwards, is uh, called lift. The effect of air resistance pushing the ball upwards, or possibly downwards. It could be negative. Okay, now if we want to improve that parabola trajectory to something accurate, if we really want to know where the ball is going to go, we have to figure out the equations that tell us how much drag and lift there is, combine that with gravity, and then we can get good equations. Okay, well, modeling drag and lift on a sphere is not a simple matter, and it's really taken a long time to fully understand it. So let's try to get into this. So I'm going to have to introduce some concepts of fluid dynamics and aerodynamics and the mathematics associated with them. So let's start with what's called the Reynolds number, invented in the mid-19th century by Osborne Reynolds. And so drag, by the way, I'm going to talk about drag because I just don't have time to do both drag and lift. Lift would be a nice story too. Uh, so drag is caused by two sources. One is the friction of the air on the surface of the ball. If, if it, the ball was uh, traveling in honey, you could understand very well that their honey would be grabbing it and pulling it back. Well, air is a fluid too, and that grabs it a lot less, but that does too. The other is there's pressure differences. In the front of a uh, ball, there's a lot of pressure from air pushing on it, and in the back in the weight, there's less pressure, and so there's a tendency to get sucked backwards. And if you have any doubt of this, stick your hand, hand out of a car window, and you'll feel a drag pushing your hand backwards. Okay. The size and relative importance of these two contributions depends a tremendous amount on what kind of flow we're talking about, and the Reynolds number captures this. So low Reynolds number flow is flow in a, with a thick, highly viscous fluid, a slow flow, steady, nice and orderly, and so forth. High Reynolds number flow is flow that's dominated by motion of a lot of fluid, and they tend to be fast, swirly, turbulent, and so forth. And Reynolds' brilliant contribution in this was to realize that this was all governed by one numerical parameter that could be computed in the following way. You take the density of the fluid, how heavy it is per unit volume, times the diameter of the phenomenon you're looking at, say the, the length of this boat or of the skis, roughly that area. It's only a rough number. Times the speed of the fluid motion, how fast the boat's going, divided by the viscosity of the fluid and you get a dimensionalist parameter called the Reynolds number. And here's some examples. Uh, well, okay, sorry. I want to, so density is the mass of the fluid per unit volume. Diameter, you know what it is. Speed, you know what it is. Viscosity measures the thickness of the fluid, and I wanted to say something about that. So basically, a low viscosity is, fluid is one that flows easily. And here are some viscosity numbers in the KMS system. So air is a very low viscosity fluid. It, you know, putting your hand moving through air is a lot easier than moving through honey, and this measures just about how much easier. It's, you'd have to take six and divide it by that, so about a million times easier. Water is uh, more viscous than air by a factor of about 50. Blood is thicker than water by a factor of about five. Corn syrup is quite a bit thicker than blood and honey. Ketchup slows very uh, slowly with a viscosity of 80. And pitch has is a, which is shown in this picture here, has a viscosity of about 200 million. This is an interesting experiment, by the way. This is in the Guinness Book of World Records as the longest run controlled laboratory experiment. It was it's at the University of Queensland in Australia. It was started in 1927. They melted pitch and poured it into this funnel, and the funnel was capped at the bottom. 
They let it sit for three years until un under controlled situation, until it got an even temperature, cooled down, everything was nice. And then they cut the funnel and they let it start dripping. And it's a fluid, so it drips. There's a, since 1930, when they cut the funnel, there have been eight drops. The last one was in 2000. And they're expecting another drop every, any year now. <laughs> That's a highly viscous fluid. Okay, let's go back to the Reynolds number. Well, let me go backwards. You remember the Reynolds number is density times diameter times speed over this viscosity. So let's do it for a golf ball in flight. The density of air is a kilogram per meter cubed. If you have a meter cubed of air, it would weigh a kilogram, which you wouldn't notice because it's surrounded by air floating in it. But if you were in a vacuum, you'd feel it weighing a kilogram. A golf ball is about four centimeters in diameter. And we, as we saw, it goes about 175 miles an hour, 80 meters per second. And the viscosity of air, we saw, is 0 0.00002. That gives you a Reynolds number for a golf ball. It's about 160,000. So remember that number. That's an important number for us. And I'll compare it to some other phenomenon. Well, it's nowhere near a Boeing 747, which is 2 billion, because it goes awfully fast and it's awfully big. Or even a blue whale, which goes pretty fast and it's pretty big. It's about the same as a fastball and a baseball. A butterfly, uh, insect flight, tends to be in the thousands or so. Blood flow is in the hundreds. A little fish, sw tiny fish, swimming around is about a Reynolds number of one. And a bacteria is very, very tiny and moves very, very slowly, a uh, Reynolds number of 10 to the minus fifth. You should think about that. What does that mean? And why is Reynolds number so important? Well, the Reynolds number tells you sort of how the flow behaves. And so that's why you can make wind tunnels and you can make a scale model of an airplane and test it. You have to make sure that the Reynolds number in your testing situation has been adjusted to match the Reynolds number of your real flight or otherwise you'd be measuring something else. So by adjusting that, that's how a wind tunnel works. So a bacteria swimming in water, that water feels like practically pitch to it, certainly like honey. It feels water is a hugely viscous fluid because at its small size and speed, it has the same effect as a much higher viscosity at a higher speed. Okay, so now we come to drag. And here, well, the story goes back to the Enlightenment, but I'm going to pick it up uh, for the beginning of the 20th century. So 1889, Gustav Eiffel built the Eiffel Tower and became one of the most celebrated architects in Europe. 1903, Wilbur and Orville Wright flew the Kitty Hawk uh, flight, and man, uh, manned flight and the airplanes became a big thing. And Eiffel saw this as the future, and he wanted to get into aerodynamics. And he said, well, I have a great a laboratory for testing out drag on aerodynamic bodies. I have my tower, and I can drop things off this in a controlled condition and measure drag. And he even built a wind tunnel at the base of the Eiffel Tower. And here he is standing high up in the tower with testing the drag on a disc and so forth. And he made, in 1912, he made a shocking discovery. And I'm going to show you the same discovery, but not, I don't have any video of Eiffel, but I have a video of Asher Shapiro from MIT uh, from 1960 showing this phenomena. So let's take a look. In the first experiment, I suspend a three-inch sphere at the end of the lever arm in the air jet. So here's a smooth sphere. We're going to increase air the air is going to blow up and see what happens to the drag force. I'm going He's to start going to measure the, motor the force now. with this scale. Go. 50 miles an hour, 75. You see that we have brought the speed up to about 75 miles per hour, while the drag force reads about one and a half units on a scale. I'm now going to increase the wind speed to about 100 miles per hour. The wind speed, you see, is about 100 miles per hour, while the drag force has increased to something a little less than two and a half units. Now I am going to increase the wind speed continuously, and I'd like you to observe what happens to the force on the scale. Here we go. Up, 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 up. But now it's going down, down, and up again. Up, up. She's continuing to rise continuing to rise. Now that was very puzzling, and it's not quite clear what happened. So I think we'd better repeat it. No, we won't repeat it. Thank you, Ash. Um, <clears throat> so what happened is you take a sphere, and as you, it, air goes by faster and faster, 
Uh, there's more and more drag on it, till all of a sudden there's less and less drag, and then there's more and more. It looks something like this. And this is what Eiffel discovered. Uh, so here's more or less the picture. At a Reynolds number of 100,000, which is the speed for a golf ball about 80 miles an hour, you're getting not too much drag, but it's going up. It's going up sort of like a parabola, quadratically. But then when you reach a Reynolds number of like 250,000, it goes down. And then it goes up again on a different parabola. So these both follow par parabolic curves, but you have this jump down. That's Eiffel's paradox, or the drag crisis. And it's, I mean, it's not a crisis if you're a golfer. It's good news, because instead of having drag way up here on the first parabola, you have about a fourth as much drag down here if you could achieve this drag crisis. So why is the question? Can we analyze mathematically why this happens? Seems a little counterintuitive, as Asher Shapiro said. So and then comes the hero of this part of the talk, which is Ludwig Prandtl. And uh, this is Prandtl. He, did, he was a mathematician and an engineer, but he did experiments. There's a picture of him in 1904, which was a big year for Ludwig, because he went to the International Congress of Mathematicians, same place that uh, Maritz said I gave a plenary talk. And he gave a plenary talk. And his became one of the most important papers in all of fluid dynamics. Uh, where he began to understand what's called the boundary layer. The boundary layer is here's flow past a sphere, and they've used a smoke or something to show it. And you see there's a very, well, you can't even see it here, a very thin layer of fluid stuck to the sphere, and then it separates off, and it stays thin for a while, and separates off. That's the boundary layer. And here's Prandtl's paper that was published in the Proceedings of the International Congress of Mathematicians. And I'm sure you all read German, so I'll just let you read it. But just in case, it says on the fluid motion by, uh, uh, on the motion of fluids with very small viscosity. And the first thing he does is he lays out these two equations. Anybody recognize them? What are those equations? I heard it. Navier-Stokes equations. These are the most famous equations of fluid dynamics. All mathematical models are wrong, but these ones are incredibly useful. And the point is he's making here is that these two equations govern the motion of fluids in many, many circumstances, including uh, flows past a sphere like this. And if you could solve these exactly, you could calculate exactly the drag and lift of golf ball and different speeds, different shapes, everything. Unfortunately, right now, there's a million dollar prize out if you can explain the theory of Navier-Stokes. Nobody can solve these things exactly. So what Prandtl did is he derives simplifications of Navier-Stokes that can't be used everywhere, but they can be used in the boundary layer, in that tiny, thin region where the flow is, not, is quite special. Then you can make a, a different mathematical model, droppling out some terms, capturing the important things, and that's a model that can be analyzed more easily than the full Navier-Stokes. And so here's some of the things he pointed out. This is a, uh, a picture from his 1904 paper. Here's a flat surface, here's a fluid rushing by, and uh, a viscous fluid doesn't move right at the surface. That's one thing that comes right away with Navier-Stokes. So there's zero velocity here, but you get just a little bit away, and this is why the y-axis has been stretched. This is only a fraction of a millimeter, all this. Get a little bit away, the, the fluid is traveling at a constant speed, and his boundary layer equations explain how these things join together. And then he started to look at the question of boundary layer separation, how this boundary gets off the ball instead of sticking to it and going all the way around. And what he said is, well, in the front of the ball where the wind is coming in, the wind gets stopped by the ball, and so it's slowed down, and therefore there's a high pressure. And then, as the, as the wind goes around, we have a sort of Bernoulli effect. The wind speeds up to get over the top of the ball, and we have a low pressure. And then at the back, we have a high pressure again. And he's showing that here, low pressure, fast air here, slow air here, imagine this was curved around the ball, slow air there. And he said what happens from this high pressure here, low pressure here, is some of the particles near the boundary layer turn around and go backwards. Watch these little sh shapes. And that's when you get a se uh, boundary layer separation. This was a remarkable piece of analysis, because here it is again. And here are some experiments made 80 years later and first of all, so here's just a boundary layer 
How, here's how this experiment works. Here's a surface. This is a wire in the fluid, a very, very thin wire, so as not to disturb things. They put a little electricity in there. It makes a line of hydrogen bubbles, and then they do a time-lapse photography and watch the bubbles move. And you see, they move exactly like Crandall described. And then here they do it again with a bunch of wires over a sphere. And again, it's exactly like Crandall described. At the end, you have this turnaround separation. So that was an amazing piece of uh, mathematical modeling and analysis. So what does this have to do with golf? Well, we're not quite there, but at least it resolves the drag crisis. So 1914, it was 1912 when uh, uh, Eiffel discovered the drag crisis. In 1914, Prandtl gave an explanation, and here's his explanation. He said, at the higher speed, the boundary layer separates later and he has to explain why, but first let's suppose that's true. Well here it separates early and you get this turbulent wake in the back of it. This is a low pressure zone and therefore that sucks the ball backwards if the ball's going this way. On the other hand, if it separates la later, you have a smaller turbulent zone and less of that effect and therefore less drag. Now why does it separate later? Well he said it separated later because the boundary layer becomes at the higher speeds more turbulent mixing the high-speed air on the outside with the slow air right near the edge, therefore speeding up the air and allowing it to fight that reversed pressure. So here's his story. The boundary layer becomes turbulent at Reynolds number about 250,000. That they knew. That mixes up fast air that's away from the boundary with the slow air that's in the boundary layer, and so speeds up that fast air. So that air can resist changing direction longer, because it's moving fa faster, has more force, and so the separation of the boundary layer is delayed. Therefore, the pressure, low pressure trailing wake is smaller, and therefore drag is reduced. That was Prandtl's uh, explanation. And how did he prove this was right? Well, he had this clever experiment. He put a, a trip wire on the ball. This is not his picture, but this is the same idea. So having that little wire on the ball, very thin wire, that triggered turbulence. And sure enough, triggering that turbulence would cause the drag crisis to happen. So that showed turbulence was, part of, was a key factor in the story. Here you can see uh, the example by looking at a flow at two different Reynolds numbers. Here's a lower Reynolds number flow. And you see the boundary layer. And it separates right around at the North Pole. But it stays nice and laminar, not swirly, till you get out back here. Here's a higher Reynolds number flow, and you see a turbulent boundary layer. It's a little shaky and wiggly, and it separates quite a bit later. That happens at around 250K. <clears throat> OK, here's the picture again of our drop at 250K. But now you should be asking yourself, well, 250K, I'm sure you've all figured out on the back of an envelope that for a golf ball, that means about uh, 205 miles an hour. And I told you a golf ball goes about 175 miles an hour. So this is a nice story, but the problem is nobody can hit a golf ball fast enough to make use of it. So what's going on? Well, we'll go to our friend Asher Shapiro. We're ready to begin the experiment now with a roughened ball near me and a smooth ball on the far Two side. Two balls, rough ball, smooth ball, on a balance to see which one has more drag. Air coming along. You see that the speed begins at 30 miles per hour, and the deflection of the balance beam indicates that the smooth ball has less drag, as you might possibly expect. Now I'm going to increase the speed, and as I do, the beam deflects still further, but the smooth ball has less drag all the time as the speed goes up to 75 miles per hour, 100 miles per hour, approaching 125. But there she turns over, and now you see that the smooth ball has more drag, indicating some sort of reversal in the flow path. OK, that's enough of that. So what he found, actually, it was implicit in, um, in Eiffel's work, and not Eiffel, Prandtl's work. Uh, Prandtl put a tripwire there, it induced turbulence, and made the drag crisis happen. Well, putting anything rough on the ball makes the drag crisis happen earlier. So the rough ball experiences drag crisis before the smooth ball. By the way, before I go on, I'll just point out that Prandtl was an interesting guy, and this was, he was something of a nerd. Um, so he gave this 
fantastic paper at the 1904 Congress of Mathematicians. In the audience was the best geometer and one of the most important mathematicians of the time, Felix Klein. He heard this guy and realized he was brilliant and put him in the head of an institute in um, Göttingen. This made Crandall's career. Ten years later, he was you know, at top of the world at the best aerodynamic institute in the world probably, and he went to his thesis advisor, August Vopel, and said, you know, I'm at a point in my life where I think I can take a wife, Herr Professor, <laughs> and I'd like to ask for your hand of your daughter in marriage. Fopel was a little surprised because he didn't even know anything was going on, but he said, oh yes, uh, which daughter? And he said, oh, Herr Professor, I leave that up to you. <laughs> Okay, so we have that a rough ball has the drag crisis first. So now this brings us to an interesting story in the history of golf. From about the uh, 15th century through the 19th century, or 16th century through the 19th century, this is what a golf ball looked like. They were made by sewing leather into a very circular pouch and stuffing an incredible number of wet goose feathers into the leather and letting it dry and get hard. It took a skilled craftsman about half a day to make a single golf ball, so it was only the very rich who could play golf. If you lost the ball, you really felt lousy. And then things got a lot better for the middle class. In the middle of the 19th century, they discovered rub rubber, and they started making uh, uh, golf balls out of gutta percha, percha rubber. There's an 1848 or 45 golf ball out of smooth rubber. And they quickly found that they didn't go as far. And then they started to notice they went further when they got sort of old and scratched up. And so this was sort of weird, and you know, golf players are always looking for an edge, and then they started hammering their balls. So there's a ball that got hammered with a pattern. And it seemed like they went further, of course. You know, it was not a very controlled experiment. Then they started by 1895, they were manufacturing the rubber balls with little bumps on them. And of course, now we have golf balls all have a dimple pattern on them. This is to take. Uh, to take uh, advantage of the drag crisis, to move from the 250,000 Reynolds number, which you can't achieve, down to a much lower number. So dimples were first patent, uh, patented in 1901, and people have been trying forever to figure out the best dimple pattern. You get a huge advantage by uh, putting on dimples to a smooth ball. These are some of the thousands of patent applications that have been filed for dimples. You've got dimples within dimples, multi-size dimples, triangular dimples, and so forth. Many, many different things there. <clears throat> this, by the way, is the cover of last month's uh, uh, notices of the AMS. I had a little article about this. <clears throat> and just to show you, sort of give you some idea of optimization, you know, people would love to find the perfect dimple pattern, the perfect shape, the perfect number of dimples, the perfect depth of dimples, the perfect profile of dimples, etc. And nobody can do it yet, for reasons I'll go into a little more. One area where they're very good at optimization is sailboat racing. This is the boat that won the America's Cup just recently. This is a field where they've optimized with computer modeling and mathematical modeling to the nth degree, and you see a uh, uh, sail barely looks like a sail now. It's almost a wing. It's been optimized uh, to something very different than a standard sailboat. Of course, you can go too far. This is <laughs> Okay, so now how are we going to get a better understanding of what's going on in the dimples? And uh, after all, I told you a rough ball has a dread crisis sooner, but I haven't really explained why. Well, we don't have a, fully, a full understanding of this yet, but we're getting pretty close. Um, <clears throat> so if we're going to optimize dimples, we're going to need more than to try crazy patterns and just try them and see what happens. There's millions and millions of ways you could arrange them on a, on a golf ball. And so you, we need mathematical modeling on this. But there's no way we're going to be able to handle as complicated a situation as a golf ball with such a complicated shape, spinning very, very fast, uh, through uh, hand analysis. That would be a very, very, very difficult case of the Navier-Stokes equations and we can't even handle simple cases. So now the, the next move is to move towards computational simulation. And this is very recent work. This is by a group under Kyle Squires at Maryland 
and uh, Bolara said, no, Cause Squares is at Arizona State, and Bolaris is at Maryland. And these are their uh, students and coworkers. And they have taken a golf ball, dimples and all, and simulated it at two different Reynolds numbers. And for this golf ball, the drag crisis happens something like 60, that Reynolds number 60,000. And so this is the, the change in the early separation to the late separation. And you can do amazing things with computational experiments like this. So here's uh, their movie, just part of it. And you can see the fantastic detail you can have here that you could never have either in a wind tunnel experiment or, or mathematical analysis. And you can zoom in and look at the effect on individual dimples, which they're about to do. And you can ask very detailed questions. And although it's a little hard to see it from this movie, what you're seeing here, you're seeing the boundary layer, and we're trying to understand why it's, um, the dimples are helping keep the boundary layer from separating. And what you see when they zoom into a single dimple is there's sort of a separation of the boundary layer, except then it reattaches at the end of the dimple. We'll see it even a little, little bit more with this reattachment area. So this is a new depth of insight into what's going on with a golf ball. It's still not uh, far enough along that we could get the perfect golf ball out of this. Among other things, that golf ball is not spinning, and a real golf ball spins at 3,600 RPM. So uh, we have to push beyond, this is the state of the art of computational simulation, but it's not quite there yet. And so I'll sort of end with uh, that note. Let's talk a little bit about computational simulation. Well, the subject started in 1950 with John von Neumann and uh, Jules Charney and Ragnar Fjortoft, who wrote the first paper on numerical weather prediction using the best computer of the time, the ENIAC. And uh, this is their grid for simulating uh, the weather over the North America. And they were able to handle 270 grid points. It didn't work that well. They missed a hurricane. <laughs> but. Um, this is uh, Kyle Squires and that group that we just saw their movie. They used 1.2 billion grid points 60 years later. And uh, how is this possible? How have we achieved this from here? Well, probably many of you would say, well, our computers are a lot faster. And this is true. This computation took about 100 hours on a 500 processor cluster. However, I did the calculation. And to check, over the past 45 years for this kind of calculation, Hardware, thanks to Moore's law, would explain about a factor of 10 to the 9 speed up, which is a lot. Algorithm improvement, that is better mathematical algorithms to solve the equations, count for about 10 to the 10th speed up. Altogether, we've had about 10 to the 19th, with the math providing even a little bit more. And of course, in the future, as computers are reaching their limits of smallness, and uh, we're limited by the speed of light and the wire, uh, more and more the algorithms are the way we're going to have to get speed. And so I'll close with a quote from the President's uh, Advisory Council on Information Technology that says this kind of computational science, this is probably the most important development of the 20th century science. Computation has now joined theory and physical experiment as, as a key paradigm of science. And it's brought us to the point where we can almost make a decent golf ball. <laughs> OK, thank you. There's a microphone for questions, by the way. Us older golfers should. Us older golfers should use a smooth golf ball. Uh, why? Why do you say that? If we don't hit the ball very fast, then we should use a smooth ball. No, no, that's not. That's probably not correct. Unless you hit it really slowly. I think this. I think the. Um, Reynolds number where it takes over for a golf ball is something like a speed of 50 miles an hour. So you don't have to be a Phil Mickelson at 175 miles an hour to get the advantage. There is at least one company, I don't know if you've heard of Cesar Golf Balls. They advertise a very nice looking, shiny, smooth ball, very expensive. And I'm sure people, you know, people buy it for their husbands for Father's Day. But it goes half as far. The difference is huge. It, the, the, the effect of uh, dimples on a golf ball 
Well, for a professional stroke, it would be a factor of two in the distance you can hit the ball. It's a huge thing. So the, the, the dimples are there for a very good reason. It makes a huge difference. And in any long drive situation, I think you have to use a dimple ball. And now you're hearing purely the mental side of golf, because I actually don't hit a golf ball at all. I may not know what I'm talking about, but I think this is generally accepted. Other questions? Um, does the spin on the ball have any more effect than just the, the say if the surface was smooth, would the spin still have a significant effect on the flight? Great question. So the spin of the ball. So remember I told you I was going to leave out lift. The spin is absolutely crucial to lift. The spin is what causes lift of the golf ball. And lift is important because it gets the ball up in the air fighting gravity so it stays up there longer and flies longer. Because once it hits the ground, it's mostly over. Um, the dimples have some effect on lift. They help a little bit. So a dimpled ball is also a little better for lift but not nearly as crucial. The major effect of the dimples is to reduce drag. And I don't know if it's 100% understood, the effect of the dimples on the lift. The basic idea of lift is as it's spinning, you're rushing air over the top of the ball, and uh, therefore it's going faster on the top of the ball, and you have Bernoulli's effect as a lower pressure, and it lifts the ball up. It's called the Magnus effect. Pro Tracer, yeah, wasn't that cool? So, uh, well, now one thing, one part of that arc that looks so much is, of course, the angle you're looking at it. If we had been looking from the side, it doesn't look nearly that steep. I mean, this thing looks like it goes up like that. So it, it goes up like that, it curves slightly up, and then it goes down quite steeply. That's, that's a typical curve. That up is the lift, okay? It's entirely lift that accounts for the fact that the ball is not, is not concave downward like a parabola, but concave up. So the spinning ball lifts it up against gravity until gravity finally beats it. And uh, at that point, it's, it's experienced a lot of drag decelerated and falls fairly steeply. Did you look at the how much of the actual, also the change of this, the path was due to the distortion of the shape of the ball? Say that again? Does the distortion of the shape of the ball have much effect on the actual flight path? Well, so, so I think the distortion of the shape of the ball, I believe, is really only for a very, very brief time at the point of contact. So roughly speaking, what's happening to the ball is it squeezes in and pops back out. And when it pops out, it returns to spherical. Actually, not really. It really will ring like a bell a little bit, but that are very, very tiny um, Effect. So I think, for example, th that shape is probably less than the depth of a single dimple. So I don't think that's such an important fa factor. But um, the treatment of the surface, the shape of the surface, affects the friction of the wind, and so all that does make a difference. If you recall, like the question was only use dragging balls, and amateurs typically pick up old balls that they find in the bushes. The ball has been scarred. Does that Okay, so now I think one could approach this question with two, two ways. <laughs> we could try to do experimental analysis and hit a bunch of different scarred balls and so forth. And I have no doubt that's been done, but I don't know the, the, by whom or the answer. And then you could ask theoretically, could we talk about the effect of scars on top of dimples at this point? And I would say we're far from being able to make that detailed a calculation at this point. Uh, the one thing I'll say is the difference between smooth and dimpled is huge, as I said, like a factor of two in uh, drive range. The, the difference between one kind of dimple pattern and another and scratches is going to be very small, but of course important to a professional golfer, a matter of a few percent, I would suspect. But I won't try to predict it which way it goes, and maybe some of the golfers in the audience have experience and would have some opinions. Uh, so why aren't we dimpling our air? Why aren't we dimpling our airplanes? Okay, the answer is we are dimpling our airplanes. In particular, we're trip wiring our airplanes. So airplane wings have little things that stick out exactly to try to control the turbulent boundary layer to delay separation. Um, those are an important part of aerodynamics. And if you go to old books on aerodynamics that came out of, they actually, very many of them were written by the students of Prandtl, like von Karman, 
who became uh, you know, the leaders in the aerodynamic industry. Um, there's a lot of study about exactly where do you put things and how do you control them. And of course, part of the trick is in different flow regimes, they act differently. So at takeoff, at landing, in shear, in wind shear, at high speed, at low atmosphere, they're all different. And you have to try to make something that works well for all these things. And so it's a very complicated problem that used to be solved with wind tunnel experiments, and nowadays it's solved with computer simulation. <coughs> Slice and, uh, is because, so what happens, you have your ball here, you have your club head which comes in at an angle and also comes down a little bit. The club heads all have grooves on them, right? And the skin of the golf ball is a little bit soft and so this rolls up on the golf head and goes off. It rolls, that's the spin. Now that's if what happens if you hit it smack in the middle right at the right angle. If you hit a little bit, it rolls this way and the spin is not purely on a horizontal axis. So then you have a lift, only the lift is no longer up, it's sideways and it sucks your ball one of the other ways. It's the Magnus effect with a misdirected angle. And it goes both ways. And it can go either way. <laughs> so I under, so huh? everything I've said sort of indicate, tells you what you want to do as a golf, uh, golfer. It doesn't help you at all to actually do it. <laughs> that's, that's not my business. You got, you got to figure out how to get the club to do that, but you want to hit it right in the middle at a nice right angle and give it a little time for that ball to roll up so it spins very quickly and gives you a lot of lift. Any other questions? Does it spin the ball stop when it hits the ground? The spin of the ball stop what? So I don't know in detail, but basically, you know, basically it's spinning very fast and it will continue to spin until it hits the ground. And golf balls are definitely spinning when they hit the ground. They often bounce backwards because of this. And in fact, golfing professionals plan on where they drop the ball because they know the bounce and so forth and try to control that. There is surely some slowing of the spin because of the friction of the air and I couldn't quantify it for you. <laughs>